Hello, everybody, and welcome to Engage, a family gaming podcast. This is episode 110, and I am your host, Stephen Dutzman. This is the official video game and board game podcast for EngageFamilyGaming.com. EFG is a website where parents like myself and all of my co-hosts come together to give parents and families the information they need to get their family game on. This week is a little bit of an interesting week. We're following up our uh, very special episode with my mom. Uh, and if you haven't listened to that one, go back and listen to last week's episode. It was really interesting. Uh, but this week, uh, it is me and my brother talking about Paris Games Week and also uh, a very eventful BlizzCon and a little bit about Xenoblade Chronicles 2 for the Switch. So, uh, obviously, video game related this week, uh, and we will be back next week to talk about the biggest board games for families to come out of Essen Spiel. Uh, I know we're a little bit late on that, but I wanted to make sure I got it right. So, um, with that said, talk to you soon. These are pre recorded segments uh, that were recorded while my brother and I were actually uh, by the beach. In fact, one of them was recorded on the deck. <laughs> because uh, we got kicked out because his daughter was taking a nap. So I um, hope you guys have a great week. Take a, Give a listen to our uh, pre-recorded segments, and uh, we will see you next week for another episode of Engage, a family gaming podcast. Hello, everybody. So now we want to talk about Paris Games Week. This is a Paris-based video game uh convention showcase not really sure what they call it but it's a celebration of video games in europe not as big as gamescom but it is still pretty important um and for whatever reason sony decided to hold a sizable press conference there um and they called it the second half of E3, which I thought was pretty interesting. And considering the list of games that, that were discussed there, at least from our perspective, um, I think they were probably right. I, well, the thing is, is that I know talking from when we did our, when we did our reactions and our, and our, and our, and our you know, post-mortems of E3, Sony came out as one of the weaker weaker performers at E3 just overall. Um, you know, most of the stuff that they were talking about was stuff we already knew about. They closed on Spider-Man and Spider-Man was awesome, but everything that they did in the Sony in the Sony release was something that showed up in a different cast. Uh, yep. Sony so, and now this one was literally Sony going, "Okay, we just needed a couple more months to t- to get stuff ready." And then they just went, "Here's our stuff." Yeah, I mean, the issue is, you know, considering the, you know, like as a grand evaluation of their performance, yeah, I mean, they showed more stuff, but it was a lot of the same, and they didn't give us any concrete release dates for Spider-Man or God of War or some of the other things, but they did show off a lot of things that would be interesting to our audience, so we made a list, thought we would just nail some of those, um, and we'll just go right down the list. First, they gave us a trailer for Shadow of the Colossus, which is an eight which is a full graphical remake of what some people consider to be the best video game of, of the PS2 generation. Mike, tell us about Shadows of the Colossus with no spoilers. Oh. Because the spoilers are brutal. Would you like me to do it? No, no, no. no, no do you no. have an elevator pitch? I uh, elevator pitch. Um, Shadow of the Colossus is a... I got it. Shadow of the Colossus is a 3D adventure game. Very similar in, in, like, presentation to, like, The Legend of Zelda. You are a lone warrior running around a with your horse on a massive world, and you are seeking out these colossus, these essentially titans, these giant monsters, trying to defeat them. For a reason, not going to talk about how you do it. Well, they are these monsters are both the boss and the level themselves. Essentially, they are platforming challenges and puzzles where you have to climb or traverse them to try and get to a spot where you can deliver a killing blow. I mean, it with that's it. I that's mean, the game. I, that's the game, but just to just to give note, Shadow of the Colossus as a benchmark for 
game design. Shadow of Colossus, it's the tools that were presented in Shadow of Colossus done well in and of themselves. It was done so well that they have shown up in future games. They've shown up in such games as the, the new Castlevania, the new Castlevania series, and they even showed up in some degrees in Mario Odyssey. In Super Mario Odyssey, there was definitely boss fights that harken back to the Shadow of the Colossus model of the boss is the puzzle. No, absolutely. Um, so, again, this is a complete graphical update. Apparently, there's going to be uh, some new control, a new control screen, control scheme. Current um, previews. Um, I, we haven't had a chance to play it yet, but current previews from larger outlets are showing that the controls are still largely the same as they were in the original game, which is somewhat problematic because the controls were one of the problems with that game, um, if there was one. But uh, my understanding is they have said that there will be a new control scheme, which will help fix some of that. Um, who knows? But it is coming February 6th, 2018. Interestingly enough, they didn't put the release date on the actual showcase. Um, people found that release date on YouTube because it was put on their YouTube channel. So... Who knows? So that's Shadows of the Colossus. The next thing they showed was the first uh, story expansion for Destiny 2, um, The Curse of Osiris. Now, um, Osiris is the Vanguard's most powerful and notorious guardian. Um, he is um, a mentor to one of the kind of paragon characters that you meet. Um, and the, he is... He's a bad mamma jamma, um, and he is on Mercury. Now, what's interesting about that is, in order to go to Mercury in the original Destiny, you had to complete this thing called the, the Trials of Osiris, and you had to win X number of games in a row. So very few players actually went to Mercury. So it is noteworthy that the new story mission, where everybody gets to go, is bringing people to Mercury, which I think is kind of neat. Um, again, Destiny is a science fiction game that spans the globe um, right now. And the solar system. And it actually spans not only the globe, but the entire solar system. Um, and we are going to, um, we're going to see, we're going to see Mercury. This is coming out in December. Um, and it's the first expansion. We have purchased that already, or, or more appropriately, that was actually provided to us by Activision. Uh, so we'll be playing that. This is going to be the first story DLC that comes up in December. The next, which is, you know, considering the game came out in September, it's a pretty reasonable time frame. And the next DLC will be coming out in spring of this year, of next year. Um, I'm excited. It's raising the level cap, new gear, new planet to explore. Um, new strikes, new stuff. Sounds great to me. I like how Destiny is is keeping up with a model and using ac the actual language itself. Uh, DL doing it as DLC content as opposed to expansions. It puts a little... It, the choice of language, I think, is pretty key just because it's like small, regular updates. Yeah. Big well, fan of small, regular updates as opposed to just waiting for... Keep in mind, last year, they had three very large... Th these are the two, the two story update DLCs for Vanilla Destiny 2. But they had three very large ex full expansions for, uh, Destin for the original Destiny one each year. So I would expect that this will be no different, but these are the expansions for Destiny 2, uh, or at least the story DLC. Um, I'm excited. Destiny 2 is a great game. We actually have a review coming. Uh, we were waiting until after the PC version came out um, to write a full review, so we will have that very soon. Um, suffice it to say, Destiny 2 is one of our favorite games of the year. Uh, it's mean... a great game, and again... I say this on every podcast I'm on. Destiny 2 is a great game for parents that want to say yes in the face of Call of Duty or Battlefield 1. Um, but speaking of games that are great to say yes to if they want to play a shooter, um, they gave us some more details about Star Wars Battlefront 2. Man, does that game look good. It is shiny. Yeah, it I'm is. excited about Star Wars Battlefront 2. They gave us some story details. Um, it's going to be more Battlefront with a story mode. I mean... It, I you they had me sold at eventually throughout a match you get points you can unlock things bigger things later in the match you can play Yoda yeah um did you they see the video 
Oh, did you see the video that IGN posted that was Yoda gameplay from Star Wars Battlefront 2? You should go find it. Everyone should go find it. It's amazing. I mean... He's a ninja. He flips around like a crazy person. I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's kind of what he does. Yeah, pretty excited. So that's Star Wars Battlefront 2. That game's coming out in a couple of weeks. Let's take a look at this. Star Wars Battlefront 2 release date is November 17th. So that's coming very soon, right before Black Friday. So pretty excited about that. Um, Star Wars Battlefront 2 should be great. Um, we will be playing the demo on EA Access. So we'll have some first impressions... Uh, my understanding is it hits that on the 11th. Hmm. So that'll be interesting. Um, so, yeah, we'll keep up on that. They gave, the next thing they showed us was Marvel's Spider-Man. Now that, that is shiny. <sighs> okay, so let's... There was a lot to unpack. Um, the first thing is Spider-Man is a superhero who is all about movement. He is all about traversal. His big superpower is he gets from place to place in a super unique way using his webs. Yeah, he uses, um, web, he uses his web shooters and he shoots webs. Yeah, and he uses those to swing through New York City. And so why, the reason I think that is useful, or why not useful, but interesting, is this game is being made by Insomniac, who's a company that made Sunset Overdrive, which is a game all about traversal. It feels like Sunset Overdrive... Which, not appropriate for kids, but it feels like Sunset Overdrive was like an audition for Spider-Man. Um, like they tested their engine. Yeah, lots of crazy jumps and grinding on, you know, power, on lines. power lines and all sorts of other stuff. Like this, it feels like they were like, hey, we want to do a Spider-Man game, but we can't do a Spider-Man game. So let's just show that we know how to get from one side of the city to the other. Um, I always use fast travel, even when it's inconvenient, <laughs> because I just would prefer to do that. I never did it in Sunset Overdrive. I don't think I'll do it in Spider-Man either. Um, Spider-Man is all about traversal, all about movement. Um, the rest of his powers are kind of mundane, really. Um, you say that. Whatever, but, he can punch people and stuff, but like it's not... No, but the in-game footage of how of, of tr converting Spider-Sense to uh, bullet time and setting up combos. Sure. <laughs> but... It's, it's you know, very, but there are plenty of people that, what I'm saying is, outside of that, it's a brawler with a guy that can, has some interesting stealth mechanics. It's true. Stick, stick the swinging. If you can stick web swinging in your video game. The rest of the stuff isn't all that complicated to make work. Exactly. Um, so, uh, we still don't have a release date. 2018. Um, probably one of my most anticipated games of next year. I cannot wait mm. to play this game. You, you, you're, you're right. You're right. It is a very anticipated game, but technically, 2018 is it, my life is ruled by Nino Kuni too. So yeah, but that comes out in January or something. So I, you're right. You're absolutely right. And until I have my hands on that game, you can't tell me about any game in 2018 yet. All right. F so fine. Sp that's Spider Man. We'll talk about Nino Kuni later. Um, they didn't show anything about it, but I'm guessing we're going to see more details about that at PSX, which. Is in less than a month. So, um, so that's Spider Man. What I also found interesting, and we have confirmation, you play as Mary Jane in certain segments. Um, so that actually is really neat to me um, because the right. So what's neat to me about Mary Jane being playable is this game takes place in his mid twenties. He is. You know, the kingpin goes down, and he's like, "Hey, maybe I can take a vacation." That means he's older. He's a professional. You have all your powers unlocked right from the beginning. Um, that's exciting to me because uh, so many games are a Spider-Man origin story. And I like the idea of playing a Spider-Man the dude. Yeah, like play. he is ready to go. He's a professional. He knows what he's doing. Um, and having some detective segments, you know, some exploration segments where you're playing as Gwen Stacy. I think that's interesting. Gwen Stacy. Not Gwen Stacy. I'm like Mary wrong, Jane. Wrong universe. Wrong universe. Um, where you're playing as Mary Jane. You know, I like the idea of having to play Peter Parker just as much as I play Spider-Man. You know, I think that could be interesting. So we'll see. Um, so that is exciting. Let's talk about some other exciting games coming out in 2018. How about Guacamelee 2? How about four-player cooperative Guacamelee 2? Yeah. Um, How about that pulling I, power? I, when they announced this on their pre-stream, I got so unreasonably hyped. I got reason, unreasonably excited. I was like... Um, Guacamelee is a better game than it has any right to be. 
True or untrue. Uh, Guacamole should not be a wonderful game. But it's amazing. It's, um, it's a Metroidvania using a Lucha Libre theme slash Day of the Dead. Uh, you play as a luchador who is trapped between the lands of the living and the land of the dead. Um, and that creates some insane platforming challenges um, in the first game. And now it's just going to get even worse. Um, but it apes on Metroid in some really awesome ways. And it's also really, the combat is satisfying. Yeah. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. It, when you get good at Guacamelee, you really feel like you're getting somewhere. And so I cannot wait to see what this game does. Apparently you'll be switching characters between the wrestler and a chicken, which I just can't wait. I mean... It's just, this is going to be great. Drinkbox Studios makes really good games. Um, again, this is sometime in 2018. They said it's coming soon-ish. Which, they said in 2018, my guess is holiday. Um, this is going to be out on everything, because Guacamelee came out on everything. It actually came out on the, on the Wii U. So, um, this is one of those games, I know they announced it on the Sony stage. Cannot wait to play this on my Switch. Ooh, portable Guacamelee. What? But much like much like the guacamole, you want to take that to go. <laughs> I don't want guacamole ever, but but that's yeah. just me. Next, uh, let's talk about another indie sequel, uh, Spelunky Two. Now, Spelunky. Oh, okay, so here's the thing about Spelunky. Spelunky is a procedurally generated, true roguelike platformer. Yeah, Michael. Tell me about Spelunky. Okay. It's a game so good the game creator wrote a book about it and it became a best selling and it became a best selling book. Yeah. Uh, Spelunky it, is you play as a dude, like a miner. Like the the, the an explorer is he an explorer? Yeah, he's a he's a he's a treasure hunter. The he's thing Indiana is Indiana Jones. Here's the deal. There's the plot and the gameplay, but and there's the plot and the gameplay, which is you play a treasure hunter who explores the depths of this constantly shifting, ever growing set of ruins and you go through one floor after another after another it's quirky it's bubbly it's just lovely and the rules and the gameplay are super simple but the de but the design but because it's the game is so simple with just some simple dungeon exploration and uh super super like precise super precise controlling sometimes it's very it's very unforgiving uh, as a rogue. As a rogue, like you know, the difficulty is hard. The death is the death is permanent. Yep. You, whenever your character dies, you have to go back all the way to the beginning, and every floor gets randomly shuffled again. Yep. Um, but in its simplicity, and partially because of its difficulty, it offers this really wonderful replayability and depth of play. This is a game that is. That will always be fun to play yep. until it's not, and it's never not fun to play. Yep. Um, I love the fact that they're picking up with the with the daughter. Of, yeah, that should be cute. Um, Daily and, challenges, and, and, and there's a mo and it's, there's there's they, the opening teaser has a thing on the moon, which could be very interesting. Oh my the, god, the, low gravity spelunky. Oh, low gravity. Uh, that's kind of where I'm thinking. I'm thinking that she's going to be going to the moon. We don't know. Um, one of the things that's great about it is it's a game that. It can be played in bite-sized chunks. I know a lot of parents are concerned about, you know, games that take a real long time to play, Legend of Zelda and things like that. Um, this is a game that can absolutely be played in bite-sized chunks. Yeah, it's, cycle, um, it's, it's play cycle is super tight. Correct. And um, daily challenges mean this is going to be an inexpensive game that um, you can come back to a little bit every day and get enjoyment out of it. Um, huge fan of Spelunky 2. Um, super glad that it's coming. Uh, I didn't think it was possible uh, because a lot of people view Spelunky as like a perfect game. Not that it is a masterpiece, not that it is the best game ever made or anything like that, it's just, but that they're really, they didn't think that there was a way to improve upon it. And here we go. Uh, the, the creator is giving it a shot. So that's coming out sometime in 2018 also. Um, we'll obviously talk about it more as it comes closer. Um, the last thing that they talked about for us was Horizon Zero Dawn, the Frozen Wilds, which is the story DLC for Horizon Zero Dawn. Oh, one and, of our uh, one of our favorite games of the year. And my prediction, your 
I called the prediction at E3 that they were going to talk about Horizon Zero Dawn DLC on this very podcast, and you called it malarkey. I did. I thought that it wasn't going to happen. Um, and so I was wrong. Um, it's coming out November 7th, which has already happened. Um, it is getting uh, it is getting good reviews. Uh, the Frozen Wilds is... It takes place within the base game. It doesn't happen after the story or anything like this. Um, and it takes place in a previously inaccessible frozen area. It includes some new monsters, including a bear um, and some other frozen variants. And it's just more of the same. It's another, it's another series of quest hubs where you go and you do stuff. So yeah. it, uh, and everybody the, and says it's every, everything that I've read says it is interesting. I cannot wait to get home on Friday and tear into it. I, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward. Hold on, hold on. We got we got one thing left. We gotta talk about Concrete oh. Genie. Yeah, let's talk about Concrete Genie. I, I, forgive me, audience. I kind we kind of went a little out of order because I wanted to save this the best for last. I think this novel. New game out of the play out of the Paris Games Week is probably my best pick for thing I got excited the most for, and that includes the non family friendly stuff. I fell in love with it. I fell in love with a trailer, and I rarely do that. But Concrete Genie is a pretty stellar game. Elevator pitch: You are a small boy. In a sit in a in a tight city town, and you have a magic paintbrush on your back, and when you paint stuff, it comes to life. Yeah, it, it, you know what it felt like? It felt like a, a Harold and the Purple Crayon come to life kind of thing. Um, I will admit that I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I love the art style. This is something where you want to look it up on YouTube. Um, it's called Concrete Genie. It looks adorable. I mean. It looks like it's the thing is is that um, any game with like a it, this game looks like it is designed with a young adult audience in mind. Very young adult targeted story. The protagonist, young adult, the stories and things that they deal with is something that's uh, that's on that level. And um, with that in mind. This is a this is a this is a family friendly game to watch for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hopefully, we'll find out more details. But it definitely looks like something uh, that families would be able to enjoy together. We know very few details. This is one of those games that they gave us a trailer. Uh, we could very well see more of it at the Game Awards, which is coming up in less than a month, um, and PSX, which is coming up the day after. It's going to be a Thursday. Will be the Game Awards. That Friday will be the PlayStation Experience. Um, media event. They're not calling it a showcase. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll see a little bit more, but I am, uh, I'm excited to see more information about concrete genie. Um, and that's it. The re they obviously talked about a bunch more games. Um, they gave us more information about the last of us part two, obviously not a family friendly game, but still interesting. Um, they talked about Detroit become human, which not a family friendly game. Other all, Either, however, will be interesting for grown-ups that enjoy some storytelling. My favorite grown-up thing, I'm really looking forward to God of War. I've never been a God of War fan before, but the idea of playing as a dad with a kid and kind of adventuring with him, I find that super fascinating. I mean, it is the least family-friendly family game because it's, it, it's a game that touches on the, the themes of family and fatherhood and uh, per, and, oh, and raising and raising stuff like that but it's a god of war game so things are dying left and right absolutely I mean I mean the, the same reason why we're so why we always kind of mention last of us on this podcast is it also hit really hard on the concept of family and fathership and leadership and all that stuff it just happened to also be an ultraviolet game yeah. Absolutely. So that's Paris Games Week. It was pretty good. It was, I mean, realistically, that was a decent second half of E3, especially from a family perspective. All, if we think back to E3, it really was, there was nothing there for us and, um, from Sony other than Spider-Man. And uh, the best thing about it, I, at least from my perspective, it was short. Like, 
the preamble, the pre-showcase was like a half hour of live stream talking, people talking, like various announcements. But the actual experience, the actual Paris Games Week opening premiere itself, it was a ha it was a half hour show. Um, you can definitely look it up on YouTube under place under the Paris Games Week showcase. Yep. And, and it's it, it's a it's a pretty quick thing. You could just watch it yourself. I highly recommend it. It's a good show to see. I don't disagree. So that is Paris Games Week. So uh, we're going to take a little bit of a break, and we will come back with another Family Gaming Talk. Peace! All right, everybody. Topic today is BlizzCon 2017. Um, BlizzCon is a unique animal in that it is a, uh, a fan festival, not unlike a PAX or a Gen Con, but it is entirely built around Blizzard games. Um, and you might think, well, Blizzard doesn't have a lot of games if you weren't paying attention. But Blizzard has slowly over time, especially within the last, I'd say, five years really up to their game. Um, so here are their games. Um, they have Overwatch. They have World of Warcraft. And Warcraft, it's historical games, which are still played. Yeah, and um, they, they launched the remaster. HD yeah. remaster. <clears throat> StarCraft 2 and StarCraft 1 remastered, which is still played professionally in some places. Um, Heroes of the Storm, which kind of encompasses all of their properties. Hearthstone... And then a couple other fringe games. Well, be, uh, uh, hey, if you want to know how many Blizzard games there are, if you own, if you play any one of those games, just go to the Blizzard launcher, and they're just all on the left hand side. Yep. Heck, there was des there uh, even Destiny Two. Destiny is part two. of the Blizzard system now. Yeah, because it's a because it's run, Blizzard is owned by Activision. So. so the the PC version goes through Battle.net, which is weird. But it fits in perfectly. It also um, means that playing Destiny 2 gives you free swag in, all, in various games. It does help. Um, here's the thing. If someone told me, and if I didn't know gaming, and someone told me that Destiny 2 was made by Blizzard, I, I, I wouldn't question it. I mean, it, it, it would be at least reasonable. I mean, Blizzard... Hit Blizzard, the one thing in the trifecta, if you listed everything except Destiny 2, the biggest hole that they would have is, well, they have a sci-fi game, but they don't have a first-person shooter experience. Yeah, I mean, they have a multiplayer life. shooter, which is Overwatch, but this is a first, like a story-based shooter experience. campaign-based, yeah. It's only a matter of time. I think that, I, I really do think that there's only a matter of time before they start making single player games, even small ones, based around um, Overwatch characters. Oh. If I told you that I came from the future and said that there was a Tracer game, would you think I was crazy? Or a Soldier seventy six game? I would. Would you think I was nuts specifically for that reason? Specifically for that reason, I like how you qualified it because I'd say. Well, because if I said I came back from the future, that by itself makes me sound kind of crazy. But if if that if that's my prediction, and how about this? I'm gonna put it right here. Within five years, they will have a game based on a single Overwatch character. I believe it will be Tracer. I think that what's going to happen is that Overwatch is going to be running will run episodic single player content that or single multiplayer things, much like. Much like how it is humorously Junkenstein's Revenge, but they will do much more historic, they will do much more serious single player, P uh, multiplayer versus PvE content. They will do historical moments in Overwatch history, they will do historical moments in Overwatch's future. All right. You want to shake on it? You want to oh, bet? Oh. With the terms to be determined by. Our wives. Our wives. We're here. Here you have it, folks. We're betting within, within the net. I'm going to say with. I honestly believe within two years we will see single player content for Overwatch for one Overwatch character. Shake my hand. And we just did it, folks. He thinks I'm wrong. I think I'm right. No, we're gonna. I think I. I think it's gonna go a different way. That's fine. You think I'm wrong. I think I'm right. 
we're going to put it on the board and uh, we're going to let people have it. I, I have said on other podcasts that I'm not a betting man, but this is one I feel very strongly about. I we will see single player content. The judges will be the audience and our wives. They will help determine, and you know that will be neutral because you know that your wife will like to mess with you and my wife will like to mess with me. So it will be equal. I'm just saying, get ready, get, get ready for them horses. I am not <laughs> get playing ready for Star Sable. I'm not doing that. No matter what, I will do something else. I will eat a ghost pepper on Facebook Live before I play Star Stable. Okay, okay. Full disclosure. I know we already shook on it. Ghost peppers are. Uh, just, let's just agree. From past ghost to peppers future, are off. off ghost limits. peppers or funny food or anything weird like that. Oh, no, I was going to make you eat a lasagna. For those at home, I discovered that lactose is my mortal enemy. You cannot inflict bodily harm. That's fair. Via that's fair. Dairy no pain. No, no dairy pain. Um, that's fine. That's fine. Anyway, so let's get into it because they made a lot of really cool announcements. They had like a keynote at the beginning. They called it their opening ceremonies, but but really, they just made a lot of announcements. And, and it's, so let's it's, just, it's basically forty-five minutes of me losing my. Freaking it's forty-five mind. minutes of Blizzard fans losing their mind. Um, so let's just roll right into it. Overwatch. They announced a new character. Her name's Moira. She is a support character. Um, I she is, is all the things. Am I safe? Is it safe to say she's basically like a shadow priest? Um. So, not what's her gimmick? Explain her, her gimmick to the audience. So, if you've never played, if you've never played any other game but Overwatch before, Moira is a biotic scientist who she does. She's part of Talon, so she's one of the bad guys. She's definitely a bad guy. She she is definitely a bad guy. Her big trick is that she has. All of her, all of her arsenal can be switched between two modes: heal and hurt. So she can either let out white energy, and that heals her allies, or she can let out black energy, and that hurts enemies. And her and ultimate and is a beam attack that shoots out both. Well, the other thing is, is that her resource pool is connected between two abilities, so you have to, you are, you are encouraged to switch back and forth because. In a very way that someone, if if you have never played a game called Metroid Prime Two, uh, you would need you need to expend resources in one mode to gain resources for the other mode. Um, if you have ever played MOBAs before, I actually play Smite a little bit. There is uh, Hell, the god, the Norse goddess of death in the Smite universe. There are echoing overtones of that character mechanically in yeah, you, in order to play the character correctly you have to switch back and forth between offense and defense and which is different because most of the other support characters in Overwatch are primarily defensive and don't and they don't gain anything from going on the offense outside of tactical advantage sometimes yeah. it's a good idea because you've got somebody you, you just happen to be in the right position to pull out Mercy's gun and just shoot a guy yeah. but there's no it doesn't help her healing anymore. Now, it just be, now deals be, with the Now, game. because of that, that puts Moira in a, in a unique position just amongst the Overwatch cast because she needs to hurt people with her hurty mode in order to heal people with her healy mode. Yep. So she needs to be closer and in more in the mix than your traditional healer or Zenyatta who can kind of like hang so out. You can't just sit around the corner and heal people forever. No. Whereas if you're a Mercy player... Most of the game is Ducking watching your angles, cover. hiding behind cover, you know, taking advantage of you know being separate from the combat, but still influencing now, it. Now, Moira I, can't do that. Now, now going back to Moira's mm -hmm. ultimate, Moira's ultimate. If you do not, if you're not prepared for it, uh, you can pull off a team kill easy with Moira's ultimate. Because she does just shoot a continuous beam of both hurt and heal. So it's kind of like it's kind of like Zenyatta. It's kind of like Zenyatta's ultimate, except instead of creating just a zone of healing and hurt around him directly, he she blasts it in a singular direction, which she can move. Which she can move. It's a channeled stream, which means um, it can it can be interrupted because if you kill her while she's doing it, she'll it drop help, it. But if she gets the right angle. And you're just in a big cluster of people fighting. She just blasts from left to right. Yeah. And she heals the guy that's hurt and wrecks your face. Yeah. In fact, if she does it in the right place, fact, that is a huge swing. In fact, all of her abilities kind of have this 
sloppy kind of sloshiness to it. Her stream of healing, actually a uh, World of Warcraft thing, it's a chain heal. So if it hits, if you hit one person, it will actually blossom. It will actually spread off of that person to several sub targets. I didn't know that. Um, I'm really excited to play this. Also, character. her secondary fire essentially shoots the magic bouncy ball of healing, which is just a slow moving projectile that bounces off walls. And if you happen to be in the radius of the ball, or you get contacted by it you get healed. She's not really good at like single point precision healing like Mercy, who she just singularly locks onto characters. But what she can do is she can just, ran she's, she's random area of effect healing. Which gives her the advantage that since she has to be out in the fight, she can fight, she can heal, but doesn't have to stay in one place. She can yeah. move around. I'm excited to see her in high-level play, and for example, in the Overwatch League, which she'll be playable by then. And that high-level play and that oh, moving around is supported by the fact that she has a short-range fade ability. Think about it like Reaper's fade ability, except it's a much shorter distance, but it's also a much shorter time. So but that means she can just basically, her idea is she can phase, you know, if you shoot ultimates at her, She'll just um, she can use away. that as an escape to deal with minor shenanigans. Yeah, this is exciting. Or if she needs to move into position really quickly, she can just fade to there. This is really interesting design space. Um, it's interesting to me that the, that of the last, um, that, it, that we've gotten two new support characters. Of the new characters announced post launch, two of them have been support. two of them have been support. One of them has been assault. Yeah, um, and one of them has been a tank. Yeah, it's been Orisa, Doomfist, Anna, and now Moira. Moira. So, um, no new defense character. Uh, they actually mentioned that during the BlizzCon thing. They were like, uh, you know, I I know. You, they, they, the, or the guy who was, who was doing the opening. Kaplan. Kaplan. He announced, he was like, I know you guys have been asking for a defense character, but here's Moira. And they didn't, ups they, uh, they didn't disappoint me. I thought Moira, Moira is a No, no, no. I, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, the reality is there's, they, they have approached defense from every way that they can. I mean, they have a sniper. They have a literal turret. They have a guy who makes literal turrets, and then they have May. Yeah. So um, I'm there's a lot. You know what? But I, every time I say, "Oh, there's no more design space," what are they going to do? They keep coming up with new guys. So I am sure they have two or three dozen characters in in the works, and the, and just they're all the minor leagues. And every time they need, they just call one up. Um, this game is going to, they're making a, they are making a professional Overwatch League. They want this game to exist for 20 to 30 years. They okay. want this game to exist forever. Hold on. Can we do a separate side shake? Overwatch movie feature length. No, I, I'm not shaking on that because I don't know if that's going to happen. But, but I wanted to say, do, so maybe they no, they're can, trying but, to but turn they, the, Maybe they can't do an hour and a half, but. They did announce the new Reinhardt short that came out right after. Yes, the so that's a good that's a good that's a good segue. But to say it, um, every time I think they can't come up with a new character, they amaze me. So Moira looks really awesome, man. The character designs on this are great. The world is almost infinite. I'm sure they have ten to fifteen characters in development right now, and are only coming up with more. Um, and I think the high level play from the Overwatch League will only give them more ideas because they're going to see where things could get more interesting, what holes are there in designs, etc. So hopefully they will react to that play to create new and interesting characters. So, next. Honor and Glory. Honor and Glory. I have not watched it because I don't want to cry. Did you watch it? Yes. It was it feels? Um, this is Reinhardt. This is Reinhardt's origin story, right? Yes. On a scale of one to feelings, it's 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 feelings. All right. Well, um, as they all have, it's Blizzard. It's uh, further, the it, it, is it for? Let me ask you some questions about it. Is this further proof that all of the characters in Overwatch are tragic heroes? Yes. Overwatch is a, the primary vehicle 
of really well-written characters, a really tried and true model is the tragic hero. And uh, every one of these animated shorts has pulled on my heartstring in a different way. Yeah, no, like you're right. They, they each each of these animated sorts not, not only highlights the heroism of those particular characters, May's one it, it, because May's story is completely different from Reinhardt's in terms of the overall themes and moods, but both show the heroism that is unique to that character. And that's and and that's what got me excited. I mean, the one thing I'll say about Honor and Glory without like doing the super spoilers is uh, there is some there is some rocket going on. Well, I mean, he does have a big ass hammer. I, so it's a big ass rocket hammer. That's true. It's a rocket hammer. So that's the Reinhardt video. I recommend if you haven't seen any of the Overwatch shorts. Realistically, even if you aren't an Overwatch fan, these are Pixar level animated shorts that talk about science fiction and or fantasy character. They're, they're science fiction characters that are really neat and very touching, super well produced, super well animated. And there we're on five now. Uh, AMA shorts. Uh, let's just, let's just quick. Uh, so there's Genji and Hanzo. Yeah. Uh, soldier 76. Uh, there's a couple of preamble ones, but there's one for, there was one with tracer and Widowmaker. Yeah. And then there was may, there was one for may. There was one for bastion. Yep. And now one for Reinhardt. And there was one for Doomfist. And, and Doomfist. No, 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 no. That was his intro. Okay, so we have to not confuse oh, the oh, introduction oh. videos oh, with was, the shorts. Okay. Was so there hasn't mind? been one. For, there, I'm going to get you. Yeah. Um, Bastion. May. And Reinhardt. Reinhardt. The, those four ones, those highlight how they're tragic heroes. And all of them are tragic heroes. Um, so this is super interesting. I, even if you're not a huge fan, go look up Overwatch short. You'll understand. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. These are man. Are they? They're so good. I just can't watch the Reinhardt one because I don't want to cry. Um, all right. And lastly, they announced the Blizzard World map, which basically is Disney World made out of Blizzard characters. This is so on the nose. It's ridiculous. It's tons of fan service. Lots of puns. Lots of jokes. Um, I can't wait to play on this map. I hope that there is a like a small world ride. With like Murlocs on it or something. You you, here's the deal. Uh, the best part about the the best part about making a fan a fantasy theme park about all of your games inside a video game is that um you can make the the you could make the theme park as elaborately fantastic as you want because it's just an art asset. You don't have to actually build the crazy ride. You don't have to actually stock a theme park with millions of Murloc mascots, but you can copy paste. Correct. So I, 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 cannot... I want to see. I want to see. It's a small world after all, and not wor- and not world. It's yeah. after all. Oh man, I can't wait. This is going to be fun. It's a new blue, and, and it's also it's a hybrid map, which means it can be used for a bunch of different game modes. Yes. Yeah. Um, which is cool. Um, I can't wait. Should be great. Sounds like it's going to be a big map too, which is kind of cool. Um, so yeah, we'll see what's going on with that. Um, so that's Overwatch. That's a lot of Overwatch news. They also announced new spectator tools um, to coincide with the Overwatch League. I'm very excited about that because um, the 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 spectator tools certainly make the um, the spectator tools definitely make things interesting because it's going to be fun, right? Like we'll be able to watch and we're not going to be stuck watching one person's perspective. It really gives you the ability to move around and, and kind of see what's happening in the game without being stuck in one person's perspective, which is good because they move fast. We'll, we'll need, <laughs> um, we'll definitely need that if we're trying to watch it on a professional. We're going to need that in order. They, they need that. They need to set up, to because they need, to essentially set, they need to essentially set up cameramen. Exactly. Um, so can't wait. It's going to be great. So um, next, they talk about World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft <laughs> is still a thing, Michael. Did you uh, know that? <clears throat> it, it's much- Not only is it still a thing, but it is still a very large part of Blizzard's success. Um, so World of Warcraft so- is not. Wait, hold on. I want to. I want to intro this. World of Warcraft is not the game-changing universe. Like it, like the whole universe revolves around it game like it was t- seven years ago. Ugh. Like, you know, yeah. at its peak, 
World of Warcraft had more than 10 million subscribers. Its subscriber base was big enough that it could, app could have applied to be recognized by the United Nations. Um, that's a big deal. Um, it has obviously fallen off. The, the, the MMO model um, has fallen off in favor of games like Destiny and other, you know, MOBAs and other, and Overwatch and other games that kind of cannibalize it. However, it still has millions of active players every day. So, speaking of that, so one of the things they introduced at BlizzCon, um, it wasn't necessarily in the Keystone, Heart Keystone, it was that key address. The opening ceremonies. The opening They don't call them a keynote. They call it the opening ceremonies. They did a diorama. And not just any old diorama. They did they did the walls of a popular city of World of Warcraft, Lord Oran, populated with Warcraft characters. Not just any Warcraft characters. Every player who went to BlizzCon who had a Warcraft character had a 3D model of their character created in 3D printing. And then they populated this diorama with everyone's characters. It is now Guinness Book of World Records for the largest, um, for the largest diorama and uh, display of a war scenario. Because there were over a million models that were, produ that were produced. That's a lot. Alliance characters were printed in blue plastic. Boards were printed in red plastic. They weren't painted. Oh man, were they not painted with like all their gear and stuff? But the silhouette of whatever gear they had was imported in. That's pretty rad. A million, <laughs> you mean like, but not that one because a million people didn't go to BlizzCon. But a million people registered oh. for this service. Oh, okay. Like a million people got this. Oh, including the, the 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 pass. Well, yeah. Not only that, but not only did but. For those for those at home, not only was Blizzard offering you know this as a convention, but you could buy a virtual ticket, okay, which allowed you to um, not only get uh, get printing, swag, get well, not only well, big ball of swag aside, you got to watch all of the stuff from Blizzard ad free, yeah, um, and you got at that point and and then. A digital copy of all those of all the swag that everybody who went to BlizzCon got. Um, but one of the perks when you bought the virtual ticket was you got to have your model printed and put on this battlefield that was displayed in BlizzCon in full glory. So when you say it was big, but it ain't, but it's dropped down, it's still a sizable number of people. Oh, listen, there are. Um, still millions of players who play this game every day. And I don't think that's going to change. The reality is Blizzard is Blizzard knows World of Warcraft is one of its more popular and more impactful brands, even if it is not its most popular. And so as the, even, I think with, a, even with only a million players, it's still a it will still run. It, it's a benchmark. Um, so because literally an op, if you told me, that Blizzard had a f subscriber base of a million players that were paying $15 a month. That is still $15 million in operating expenses per month to I keep the servers running, to keep the game going. That is enough income to keep that game going. Um, even, if, even if it was only half that, they could run the game. Um, so I think that it will be going for quite some time. And with that, um, our, I'm not saying our children's children will be playing World of Warcraft. That's a little know, insane. But, but, I, but I know Evan and Jake. I know and both of my kids want to play, um, and Evan will be. Where our internet is and streaming is a little difficult. We're upgrading our internet, and Evan will be uh, playing some of these Blizzard products. And we're going to be talking about some interesting new stuff for World of Warcraft. Um, he's going to be doing some of the stuff, including um, before we talk about one of what I think is their biggest announcement. One of the most interesting announcements is they announced classic servers, oh. meaning they're going to yeah. You and I are going to have a fight about this right now because I think it's perfectly fine. No, no. I what they are doing is they are opening up servers to play vanilla World of Warcraft, meaning World of Warcraft up to the last expansion or last content update before the first expansion, which is the Burning Legion. 
a lot of people have expressed an interest in playing World of Warcraft like the good old days. Because at this point, that's basically a retro game. Yeah, we're talking about a legacy server. And there have been other companies, not companies, but groups of volunteers who have put together legacy servers that were essentially pirated copies of the game where they stripped out all of the code that was related with the expansions, which was a mountain of work to do without official support, um, and took dozens of people, if not hundreds of people to do, but it's illegal because you can't. You can't host their game for free. Um, and so Blizzard went after them regularly to take them down. It turns out that we don't know what came first, them taking them down or them deciding that they were going to have their own classic servers. We don't know which came first, but we know they were related um, because now they're going to have their own. They're going to have classic servers where presumably people who pay for a subscription will also be able to just roll a character on a classic server and play as though the, the expansions never came out. This means that um, it's just the two main continents, means that the level cap will be level 60, means that the raid content ends at Nax Ramus, the first one, right? Yeah. Um, and there are people who will be very, I, I think, I don't think long term it will be super popular, but um, I think that it has... I think it has, considering the relatively low cost, to put up five or six of these servers and eventually condense it down to one when it slows down, I think this has the potential to be great fan service. Um, and it's not like it really costs them a lot. Obviously, they have to develop it and put it in and make it stable and things like that. But, and I'm sure it will have some Blizzard touches, maybe new textures, make it run on new machines, that type of thing. But... They'll, We're not talking millions of dollars. And they'll probably have a one-way export feature. <laughs> Who knows? We don't know. Um, but I think it's kind of neat. Now, the bulk of their announcement was the new expansion. Horde they, versus Alliance. The, the bulk of their expansion and the bulk of that cinematic. Cinematic was real cool. That cinematic... Um, I I don't... I'll, I'll admit when I... Specifically, when, it was called World of Warcraft, The Battle for Azeroth. Um, uh, when when I stopped playing World of Warcraft, I'll admit that I that I kind of dropped off a little bit in terms of the lore and stuff. But uh, yeah, I didn't know I didn't know that World of Warcraft could be that epic anymore. Uh, I was wrong. I was a dead wrong. Um, you yeah that that is um, I I didn't know I didn't know Sylvanas could fight like that. <laughs> Yeah, well, Sylvanas is pretty powerful. So I forgot she was a banshee queen. That I, I would invite everyone to watch the cinematic if if you're vaguely aware of uh, the World of War, the Warcraft mythos, or even just like a good solid fantasy uh, thing. But I forgot that Sylvanas is a banshee queen, <laughs> and she she went full banshee. You're never supposed to go full banshee, but she went full banshee. Oh, she absolutely did. Um, um <clears throat> excuse me. So essentially the battle for Azeroth um is a, it, it's a return to Warcraft's roots is how they are building it. Basically, recent expansions have forced the Horde and the Alliance to work together. The Horde is the bad guys. They are the air quotes bad guys. And the Alliance are the Good guys. And they've been forced to work together for the last handful of expansions to face common threats. Demons. De various demons and various dragons. All sorts of stuff. This game... But the, but the heart of World of Warcraft is conflict between these two armies. Yes. And the battle for Azeroth kind of returns that back. Which, truthfully, is something the fans have kind of missed. They missed that antagonism between the two groups. Right? Yeah. Um, it was there... But it was never there in the last couple of years. So here it comes back. So some of the big expansion, the big news, raises the level cap. You can play as neutral races that kind of pick sides like Dark Iron Dwarves and things like that, which is neat. It's neat. Um, well, they, well they, they prototyped that with Mists of Pandaria, the fact that you... Yeah, now you have a whole bunch of new ones, uh, which is kind of interesting. One, the thing that I find the most interesting area... Um, 
is um, the there's an islands system, which is essentially a series of islands that you can explore, where you form a group of three, and you go to an island, and they are randomly generated with terrain, and just, I'm sure procedurally generated with monsters and loot and, you know, various other things. I think that is fascinating. So you're talking about a three-man... If you're telling like that, I'm already sold. You're talking about a three-man procedurally generated... Instance. Procedurally yeah. generated instance. Which is something that a lot of fans have been asking for because running the same dungeons over and over again is kind of rote. Um, so that's neat. Also, you know... You know, even with the increase in, in looking for group technology, sometimes you want to play with your friends, and sometimes you only have two other friends. So, if you only have two other friends in World of Warcraft, this is, you know, this is your jam. This is this thing. Okay, so, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think it'll be fine. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so, that is coming out in 2018. Um, it's raising the level cap to 120, ah, which is insane, uh, um, which is double the original. Um, I'm excited to play this game. Um, it includes two new, um, you know, two new zones. It, you know what? Here's what it is, guys. It's a, World of, it's a World of Warcraft expansion. Obviously, we will get it. We will be getting more details as we get closer. Um, but hey, new World of Warcraft expansion. Um, Evan's excited. Um, yeah. One of the big changes is uh, that they didn't really bring up, but has been come up as part of interviews afterwards, is that they're removing PvP servers. Um, so what that does, and the way that works, is every server will be a PP, PvP server if you choose to make it that way. You'll be able to go to your capital city, talk to your leader, and op opt into the war effort. And that will give you a... Um, and, and and that will make you be PvP active forever. My understanding is there's no way to turn that off. Um, they're gonna they're working on some kind of a reward system for players that are willing to play the game on the hard mode, but we don't know what that will be yet. But that's all coming alongside the expansion. So that's World of Warcraft. Next, these next ones are a couple are relatively quick, so we'll just go through it. Starcraft Two is going free to play. Here's what that means: on November fourteenth. The story campaign for Wings of Liberty, that's StarCraft II Part 1, will be free to play. The multiplayer components will be unlockable through play, and they will be free to play. The multiplayer, all of the multiplayer, including co-op, will be free to play. The story missions you'll be able to buy, the other two story missions, the one for the, um, the Protoss and for the Zerg, mm -hmm. will be $15 each. Um, you, you but the, but Wings of Liberty is zero. You can't. You can't. There's no in-game currency to buy. No, Dang. there is not. I was hope. I, I'll what you were hoping to be able to get something for free. At look, I play Hearthstone. That's what I do. Sure. So that's StarCraft two. You know what? I'm interested in that. Um, I think that's a neat. They want to make the key is the multiplayer game is free to play. Always, yeah. Um, that's a big deal. So that is the upgrades to StarCraft. We got two new hot, uh, Heroes of the Storm characters, Hanzo from Overwatch, and Alex Straza the Life Dragon from World of Warcraft. That's interesting. We'll see. Um, and la So those were two quick little announcements. Last, let's talk about Hearthstone. Yeah. Michael, tell me about, about Kobolds and Catacombs. For the Horde. Well, except it's Treasure Horde. Um <laughs> <clears throat> for the H O A R D, for those of you who are the, uh, for those of, of the of that speak fluent pun, um, Kobolds and Catacombs is the most recent expansion coming out for the for the Hearthstone digital card game. Uh, it is um, outside of an expansion of a, probably going to be about like 135 cards for all the various classes and all that stuff. Yep. Um, it is unveiling a new single player PV, uh, PVE person, a single player play experience called the Dungeon Run, um, which, in my opinion, hard, it, there are a lot of other multi uh, online card games that do similar things um, with it. But a Dungeon Run is a, a Dungeon Run is a um, 
custom generated event that puts you puts you in the role of one of the classic Hearthstone uh, Hearthstone healer heroes playing a small limited deck of cards versus a gauntlet of various bosses as you defeat each of these bosses at escalating levels of difficulty okay. you get to add a small collection of cards and a single treasure to your deck which you then have a chance to draw and play okay um if you're if you if you might know uh, so the treasure is a single card and they're all just bonkers from a hearthstone perspective there is a card that you can play that fills your hand with coins uh the zero mana card that lets you gain one mana for this turn only uh there is a spell you can play that say all your creatures cost zero this turn um there is a card that costs zero that you can play that says um minions in your hand and deck get plus one plus one uh, okay. these, so you only, but you get a random chance of getting these treasures after every boss. So you're never going to get the same treasures in the same dungeon run. Similarly, the cards that you add to your deck are groups of three or four that have a theme to it. One of them is usually legendary friends, which is usually when you get a set of legendary creatures of various strengths and roles. Okay. And Element, you can get ele you can get groups of elementals. You can get if you're you can get direct damage spells. They're all base. They're all themes that rotate around the various classes or the various types of neutral themes. If you get all the way to the end, you get you the 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 dungeon run ends at eight at eight encounters, and the eighth boss is hard. Very similar to the Arthas encounter. That came out recently for Knights of the Frozen Throne. It is it is in, it is meant to be difficult, even for the most experienced players. But unlike the Arthas challenge, which um, drew upon your pool of cards, this encounter, because of the way that the dungeon run is built, and you build your cards as you go, self-contained in the experience, there is no um, pay-to-play gap. Okay. Because every dungeon run is unique in of itself, and everyone is kept on an even playing field. Um, other highlights in here in uh, Kobolds and Catacombs is that um, as of Monday, as of Monday after BlizzCon, everybody got a free legendary Marin the Fox as part of just playing the game. On launch day. Um, every player will get a free legendary that is one of the legendary weapons that's being released for each class. Uh, each class will have a legendary creature and a legendary weapon. Every account is going to get a free legendary weapon on launch. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm super excited. Can you run this dungeon run multiple times? Yes, it this, is, is, it, this is meant to be a repeatable PvE experience. Uh, PvE and you don't earn gold. Um, I'm assuming, much like an arena run, it will either you will either have to pay gold or dollars to run. And by successfully getting to the eighth boss, it, it, much like an arena run, the more wins you have, the more reward you get at the end. Sounds good to me. So that is the expansion to Hearthstone, and it's and they didn't announce when the release date is, but they're saying within the next month ish. Yeah, so probably before the end of the year, just in time to compete for my time with Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. So that is our update from Blizzard uh, BlizzCon 2017. Man, that's a lot of stuff. Yeah, that was that was some, um, that was a heavy slog. So, um, folks, thank you very much. We will take a break, and we'll see you in a little bit. Bye Peace. now. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Engage, a family gaming podcast. I'm still Steven, and I'm still here with Mike. Now, interesting thing happened this week. We watched Nintendo Direct. We watched Nintendo Direct. And it was only 15 minutes long. And in 15 minutes, I wanted to steal your Switch. Yeah. you. And so <laughs> the reason for that is a little game called Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Now... Because I, I love me some JRPGs. I know you love some JRPGs. So do I. Now, for those that are curious, um, this is what happened. Uh, this is a game that we knew was coming out. I enjoyed the first one in the series, and I was interested. Yeah, middling. 
Middling, middling interest. interest. I was, you were glad that it existed because yeah. it was going to make people happy. I was glad that it existed because it sounded neat. And in 15 minutes, you got super hype and I wanted to commit felony robbery. Yeah, exactly. Um, spoiler alert, don't steal my Switch because it's for my kids. I Look, I, I said... For my kids, in air quotes. I, I said wanted to, will never. Of course. But, so here's Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Um, for the uninitiated... Xenoblade Chronicles 1 came out for the Wii. It is very highly regarded. Metacritic currently has a... Metacritic, which is a... It's a Rotten Tomato... It's a Rotten Tomatoes for video games. Yeah, it's aggregation. Yeah. um, Has a... a, uh, Has it in the high 80s, low 90s, last I checked. With its biggest problem being that it was on the wrong system just because the Wii U was not... No, it wasn't on a Wii U even. It was just a Wii game, meaning no HD graphics. Everything looked like it was covered in Vaseline... So it was just kind of smudgy. Yeah. It really didn't look great, but it was amazing for what it was. Um, and I really enjoyed it. It was very long. So long, in fact, I never got a chance to finish it. Good news. You don't have to have finished or even played the first one to understand it. Um, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a game that is a fantasy world, a science fiction fantasy world, where um, it's very anime-inspired. Yeah. But you play on a world that is comprised of a series of titans... They call them... No, no, they're the titans. They're, the they're titans. titans that are living land masses. That can be explored and treasured. They can be explored, that are so big that they can be explored. Cities are built on them. Yeah. This is a big, big thing. And in this world, those titans are dying. And shenanigans ensued. Shenanigans are afoot. So you play as a character named Rex... A very JRPG name, if who I may. Very, who very much has the, the whole salvager spiel to him. His job is to go around and kind of find materials to help people build their cities up and survive in a climate that is getting more and more harsh as the years go by because and, the land masses they live on are dying. Uh, yeah, and then uh, he comes upon a bit of an issue, that issue being uh, he'd, be a bit, uh, he'd be a bit dead. He'd be killed by who we presume is one of the villains in the game. Can only presume. Um, and he comes across a woman named Pyra, who is an artificial intelligence. Yeah. A robot, shall we say. An android, maybe. Uh, we don't really know. Yeah. Um, who gives her bit. half of his life force yeah. in exchange for him escorting her to a place called Elysium, which is the a leg- legendary place that... Before all the Titans. And before all, all the Titans. Basically, and- a Shangri-La... A heaven, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And then, and so a JPRPG plot is afoot. The lucky, the lovable, lucky scrapper hero meets magical girl and they go on a trip. And so the co- so that's the story. We don't know the rest of it. That's just, the, they gave us the setup. That setup is good enough for me. It's as good as any. Yeah. Um, and the mechanics of the game can be described this way. Tell me if I'm wrong, Mike. You create a party of three adventurers, they are called. Drivers. And each of them can equip up to three blades. Of which of which the woman the little, the girl that you rescued is uh, one of them. And these blades are basically they rep they are the physical representation of your character's weapons and the skills that they can use, and they rotate between them. I, I think the you describe this off mic as Kind of like picture your Pokemon. Imagine if you could make a Pokemon out of smaller, more specific Pokemon and have their moves like trying to transfer in. Like you are – the driver is the character you control. The blades are assets that you have available to you but you essentially equip them. So yep. I wouldn't. So that's why I'm saying it's more, it's a very akin to Pokemon because you equip these blades like a Pokemon trainer equips Pokemon. Yep. Except it would be like if Pikachu was also a spear. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So so not only do you get access to like uh, the, the 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 statistics and various things of a weapon, but you also get the personality and. Uh, yeah. Role play of a, of of a, of a friend and comrade in arms. I mean, you can level up all of these blades not only by level but by trust. Playing, it, having these blades equipped for longer unlocks more abilities just by having them around. Yeah. In fact, one of the characters in your party, uh, Tora, who is this little like round. They're from the first game, but I don't even know what they're called. But they're these like spherical like cat dog 
creatures definitely with funny ears. Sounds, definitely sounds like an anime cheerleader, like mascot character. Yeah, sh- sure. But you earn one of this character's like exclusive blades by playing an arcade game in a, in a toy shop somewhere, and which is cool. So. Um, we're excited to play this game. It comes out December 1st. It already has a season pass for um, it know, DLC. Has, it already has a pre-release bonus. With pre-release bonuses. I mean, this is going to be a big deal. This game is going to be very long. Uh, it's going to be very involved. Um, I'm really excited. The one thing that the Switch doesn't have right now is a long, with the exception of Skyrim, which is coming out very soon, it does not have a long, meaty, RPG, and this feels like one that really, especially if it embraces its mobile, like handheld gameplay, yeah. um, that the Switch is capable of doing because it's a hybrid system. Uh-huh. Um, this is going to be, uh, and this will be great because you, you, lots of bite sized adventuring. You can go out and give yourself small objectives like going to collection points and collecting resources, or maybe just popping on to send some of your unused blades to go on a quest. Things like that. So I am very excited. I, I am I am excited <laughs> as much as I can be for a person who really wants a Switch but is not getting a Switch in the immediate future. But that means you're going to have to come play with me. Yes. So that is Xenoblade Chronicles 2. We're wicked excited. We're going to have more information about this as we um, move forward. Yep. Because the game comes out December 1st. Obviously, they're going to be giving us more information. Um, and I will be playing it. Um, I wasn't going to get this game on release day. I have to now. Kind of. Uh, because, I, man, is it good. This is going to be like my holiday game, I think. I Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still looking for my RPG that I'm going to be playing that I'm going to just... I'm going to, I'm going to get my grind on. This... this I... I, I know we don't I know we don't rate games on Engage Family Gaming podcast, but I will give this a unique rating. I will give this nine grinds on the pepper. Yeah, man, this is going to be between this... all the things they were talking about, all the like different blade combinations and putting weapons together and all that stuff and all the various can, questings. Can you do me a favor for the uninitiated? Can you explain what grinding in an RPG is? Because okay. a lot of people are going to be okay. questioning for what those... the hell you meant. You've okay. referenced that three times. Okay, so for those of the uninitiated, I'm just. Uh, uh, I will explain this with my with my with my target audience in mind. To grind is to say, this game has a lot of content that is repeatable in pursuit of a larger goal. Um, you gather materials for the goal of building better weapons. You hunt monsters with the goal of increasing the power of your party members. Yep. You uh you. You hang. You send out your party members on various small missions with the intent of building up trust with them. Um, when executed properly, they are. It's 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 seamless. It's time just whizzes by. Whizzes by. The term grinding comes from a, comes kind of. A, it, it's it's a negative word turned positive, because a grind just. It's when it's when those things kind of go off in a in a bad way, when it just feels like you're just turning the mill on a you're just turning the pepper mill, and you're just grinding that pepper over well, and over. People, and over. The, the, that's not really the analogy people are talking about, Michael. When they talk about the grind and think about it negatively, th- people think about the daily grind that you're just going through the motions, that you're doing what needs to happen to slowly churn away. Um, you know that's where the negativity comes from. But there are whole there are gamers like myself and you who really enjoy taking small actions that over time build things up. Um, and it is a necessary component in a lot of role playing games. Um, some people don't. Some, that's one of the reasons why some people don't play them. Um, if your kids play Pokemon, they grind. They just don't know it. Yeah. That's they get stuck on a gym. They step back, they go to a field of grass, and they just walk around fighting Pokemon repeatedly. Yeah. The or ad- maybe they fight lots of Pokemon in the hopes that they will randomly cap, that they will randomly find one of the rare Pokemon in a field of grass so they can try and capture it. They are grinding to get that Pokemon. The, the so be- this is something best- that happens in a lot, a lot. It's true. The best, ki- the best kind of grind is the grind that is concealed within another, act- another activity. Absolutely. And so that's a game design thing, and we can talk about that on another time. But I just wanted to, I wanted to. Def- Fine grind yeah, yeah. as best we could, yeah, yeah. Um, because I think that is 
Um, something that comes up a lot, especially when talking about Japanese role-playing games, because that is a key part in a lot of what they do. Yeah. Um, they kind of extend the gameplay of their games into hundreds upon hundreds of hours by including these grinds for players who are truly dedicated to it. Um, and I think this is one of those games that's going to do that to us, but I think that it's going to do that in a good way, at least from what we can see now. Yeah. I am very interested. You'll be able to sink into this game like a good series of novels. I agree. Um, so, that's Xenoblade Chronicles 2. That's our little preview based on the Nintendo Direct. It's coming December 1st, which is very fast. Um, I doubt we'll see more information in the form of like a Nintendo Direct between now and then. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm there. So, we will uh, talk to you all soon. Thank you very much for listening. Do we, you need, we need to do... Not doing an intro. We're not doing an intro? Nope. I'm going to do that separately. These are literally intended just to be rapid fire segments. No around the horn, no sec, just nothing. No, 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 hold on, hold on. We need, I need, I need practice. Hello everyone and welcome to Engaged, a family gaming podcast. This is a... It's not engaged. It's just engage. Right. Did you not know that that's the name of the show? You've been on it for like two dozen episodes? Yeah. Okay, three. You want to warm up? Yeah, that's why I'm warming okay. up. I'm doing the intro with the warm up. Okay, so do it. Ready? Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Engage, a family gaming podcast.